Nobody in the room minds if I take off my mask, right? Oh, wait one sec. Adam says that he wants to watch. <laughs> Good slime. Watching fun around. Okay, it's me uh, versus Ramsey and Becca. What? No, not me and Arjun. Arjun got COVID. I'm just an African. Yeah, no. Alright. No, yeah. I'm gonna put you on mute, but just enjoy the round, okay? Yeah. This computer. Uh, I was put like right. Wait, can you see it? Oh yeah, you can. Okay. but a caching that hurts our country's progress, I negate. Contention one is a political pandemonium. Subpoint A is capital. The Build Back Better bill is on track to pass, as Apple White from yesterday writes that Senator Manchin opposed his party's Build Back Better Act last year. His opposition sank the massive spending bill. However, Manchin is now embracing a new version of the same bill. Specifically, Permit 22 explains that Democrats, including Manchin, have indicated that, we, that they would revive the proposal and keep provisions to curb climate change, but scale back pieces Manchin opposes. Unfortunately, HSR saps political, political capital and creates political gridlock, as Con 21 observes that a partisan split could discourage the Biden administration from investing political capital on the high costs and political messiness of a high-speed rail. Putting Triple B into law now is key to climate efforts globally, as Plumber 21 writes that if the bill passes, the U.S. will could cut emissions in half by 2030, bolstering global efforts to stave off a drastic rise in temperatures. If the bill dies, it could prove impossible to meet these targets. This would be devastating, as Taylor 19 concludes that air pollution will kill 150 million people for every one degree of warming. So point B is staying blue. Right now, Democrats are set to win the November midterms, as Harwood 22 confirms that in 2022, the political geography is decidedly blue, Democrats can hold the Senate by simply re-electing incumbents. Unfortunately, due to high costs, HSR is politically unpopular. As Shainer writes, if another election were to take place, 59% of people said that they would now vote against the passage of the HSR project, including 73% of Republicans and 49% of Democrats. Indeed, O'Toole 22 writes that the HSR is likely to carry less than 2% of the nation's passenger travel. Staying blue is crucial as partisan change disrupts economic recovery. Indeed, Lee 21 explains that the U.S. economy is on the brink of completing COVID recovery. Policymakers should complete the process of getting this virus under control. The priority now is safely reopening the economy. We're making good progress. Economic stability is vital to prevent crisis escalation. As Bremer 21 concludes that the financial crisis of 08 brought politics into economic performance. We also face a growing number of transnational threats. Dark clouds now hang over us. This creates opportunities for a new breed of populace who offers scapegoats and promises of protection. The risk of misunderstanding rises, accidents are more likely and more likely to escalate towards conflict. Contention two is prolonging the pandemic. New COVID vaccines are on the horizon, as Wu22 writes that Pfizer and Moderna are cooking up America's first retooled vaccines, better matched to new dangerous variants. 
As a result, COVID is on the brink of endemic stability. As Crop 22 explains, that COVID can become endemic similar to the common cold with vaccination and natural exposure pushing the virus towards endemic stability by 2024. Unfortunately, ATSR reverses our COVID progress. For example, in China, despite having the highest vaccination rates globally, Wan22 finds that because of close quarters, urban development, and rapid transmission, HSR increases the probability of the COVID-19 infection by 45%. Moreover, Zoo22 observes that HSR connectivity is significantly correlated with the spread of COVID, while no significant correlation was found for air and road connectivity. This would cross the threshold of another resurgence, as Zhang21 writes that a resurgence of COVID is possible as a 40% increase in transmission would yield yet another rebound of infections. A resurgence is dangerous, as King21 confirms that as the virus encounters increasing resistance from antibodies among people who have been infected, new mutations take hold, which is why Linguini22 estimates that it could take 10 years for COVID to reach endemic status without controls, letting COVID get out of hand over and over, causing the transmission to become unstoppable. Unfortunately, poor COVID management in the U.S. spills over, as volume 16 writes that because the U.S. has highly connected individuals that can be super spreaders, changes of global outbreak pose a greater risk. Preventing 10 more years of COVID is crucial, as in just two years, the World Health Organization 21 writes that the death associated with COVID was 14.91 million. Independently, prolonging COVID hurts vaccine development for years to come, as Roberts 21 explains, the COVID pandemic has disrupted prevention and treatment of a host of diseases and max vaccination campaigns have come to the halt. Devastatingly, Ronu 17 concludes that many diseases do not have vaccines and developing them takes too long when pandemic is underway without preempting these uh, predicted diseases to cause outbreaks or lead to an existential threat on par with climate change due to rapid mutation. Thus, I negate. We affirm our sole contention is bridging the gap. The U.S. is chronically underfunding public transport. Wacomo 22 writes that funding for public transport such as buses, trains, and subways received four times less funding than roadways. This is devastating as Heller 21 explains that black residents are more than five times as likely to uh, rely on public transportation to access vital services and job opportunities. However, Jenkins 20 furthers that only white, highly educated, and high-income residents have great access to public transportation. Fortunately, investing in high-speed rail within the U.S. connects low-income communities to greater opportunities in three ways. First is worker mobility. Currently, job opportunities are escaping low-income communities. Toma 15 writes that the number of jobs near Hispanic and black neighborhoods have decreased by 17%, forcing people of color to look for work outside the walls of their community. Unfortunately, CBS News writes that longer uh, commutes further entrench individuals in intergenerational poverty as they're forced to reduce the time they have to care for their families, perpetuating socioeconomic inequality across generations. Thankfully, like their name, high-speed rails are fast. Gao 20 writes that high-speed travel has extraordinary time-space effects, which allows for unrivaled possibilities for workers to travel from impoverished neighborhoods to metropolitan cities. For example, Schmeider 18 writes that expansion of high-speed rails in Germany reduced travel times by 10%, thus increasing the number of commuters by 840,000. Thus, Wait 21 writes that high-speed rail could provide a means to access jobs and wealth. High-speed rail provides worker flexibility and offers more choices and options for workers. This is crucial, as Beauchard 15 of Harvard concludes that the single strongest factor for escaping poverty isn't crime, test scores, or two-parent families, but rather commute times. Second is job creation. Investment in HSR has the potential to spur employment. Manita Transportation Institute writes that funding and construction of a national HSR development would exponentially increase job growth in the near and medium term as HSR development creates jobs across multiple in industries such as construction, manufacturing, and uh, engineering. Specifically, HSRA 20 finds that high-speed rail construction would create 1.16 million jobs each year, and due to long-term maintenance and high-tech support, every job in railway supply leads to 4.2 million jobs in supported industries. Increasing U.S. economic growth is uniquely important right now, as Watari 22 reports that recession risks in the U.S. are uncomfortably high as economic growth has slowed combined with high inflation. 
Infrastructure spending is key to keeping out of pop keeping people out of poverty, as German 09 finds that the 2008 recession package kept 9 million Americans out of poverty. And finally, third is air pollution. Low-income communities are disproportionately affected by air pollution. Colmer 20 states that areas that were richer and whiter in, uh, since 1981 have become relatively less polluted over time, whereas the American Lung Association 22 writes that communities of color are exposed to 28% more pollution and about 137 million Americans are living in areas with unhealthy levels of dirty air. Thankfully, high-speed rails can reduce carbon emissions across under-resourced communities in two ways. Uh, the first way is through efficient transport. Wang 22 writes that HSR expedites the cross-regional flow of talents, goods, and information, which improves pollution control. The second way is by substituting motor vehicles. Uh, Wang 22 furthers that motor vehicle fuel emits large amounts of air pollutants and traffic congestion ex exacerbates the problem. However, rail transit consumes the least energy and emits the least pollutants. Indeed, Hohai University quantifies that with HSRs, air pollution decreased by 3.5%, saving more than 50,000 lives in a couple cities alone and decreasing health costs by more than 65%. Um, and to put impoverished communities on the track to success pays a term. like low-income communities through worker mobility. Mm -hmm. So your, is your statistic that you cite talking about low-income communities specifically, or is it just talking about worker mobility being improved for the general populace? Yeah, so our Beauchard 15 evidence specifically talks about how worker mobility and lower commute times is the single strongest factor in determining whether someone escapes poverty or not. It's not education, it's not crimes, it's not whether your right. like, household has two parents. Okay, so if these low-income communities are occurring out of the proximity of a high-speed rail, how do they even get access in the first place? Well, we're saying that communities like, cities like Detroit or like Oakland, right? They're within reach of like a bigger metropolitan city where they can access more jobs, but they don't have the um, infrastructure to access that because they can't afford cars, which is our um, Heller 21 evidence that tells you that POC rely five times more on public transport for work opportunities. And also like the commute times are just incredibly long, um, which, so like, High-speed rail is uniquely important to help those communities um, because with those high-speed rails, then they can actually access these jobs um, and escape poverty. You can have a question. Okay, so you say that like 73% of Republicans oppose high-speed rail. Would these Republicans vote Democrat if like high-speed rail wasn't built? If that was like, is that the key issue stopping them from voting Democrat? Um, no, no, no. The argument is that if we vote for high-speed rails, we fiat that bill into existence, but. Oh wait, you're talking about the second subpoint. Okay, yeah, so basically we force high-speed rail to be voted into existence, so it's not like whether Democrats switch to voting for high-speed rail, that high-speed rail is guaranteed to be vote, voted into existence because of like the fiat rule in debate. Right, but you're saying that because high-speed rail gets voted into existence, people switch political, like people switch political parties, like Dems just suddenly become Republicans and no, no, no. Republicans the, wouldn't the, vote the, Democrat. The evidence that I read to you says that 49% of Democrats oppose it and 79% of Republicans oppose it. So if you don't have majority vote for something, then they're not going to like be able to like put, they're not gonna put people in power that they, you know, but do a we party agree that, that like, something that they don't like. Do we it's, it's also like the argument isn't specifically Republicans and Democrats. It's more about moderates switching their party because moderates don't necessarily like align with either political position. They'll switch their party based on certain policies. But do that you have passed. any statistics about moderates? Because I only heard no, about yeah. Dems and Republicans. I think I, I think the statistic says like sixty nine percent of nonpartisan, which would be moderates, say that they would vote for the HSR. Okay, and does that say that's the key issue for moderates? I said that they would oppose it, and okay. so that would be that would be the key issue. I said they would vote against it specifically in the evidence. Uh, there's only like, I guess I can take a small question. Um, on your argument about like job creation, mm -hmm. how high paying are those jobs? Like, are those enough to lift these people out of poverty? I mean, we're just saying that these jobs are like good because these it's like more jobs that people can access in addition okay. to. Yeah. I'm gonna take uh, 
six and prep time. I'll begin that now. I was pro. I was 220. Just gonna be down the case. Overview to their cold case, the O'Toole evidence from our case finds that only 2% of people would ever be willing to ride the high-speed rail because the cost of it is so high that most low-income communities that they talk about can't even afford to get on the high-speed rail in the first place. If they wanted to be talking about accessibility, they should be talking about the uh, they should be talking about high-speed rail improving the amount of people that can that it can actually support. With that, let's address their first link about worker mobility. Worker mobility. First of all, it doesn't affect these low-income communities because remember, if high-speed rail isn't even built in communities like Detroit and like rural communities with a lot of low-income people that they talk about, they're not even going to have access to these rails in the first place. But then second of all, you turn the argument against them because what actually happens when we have worker mobility is it spreads COVID more rapidly. As Fuller in 2021 writes that COVID or the COVID spread actually increases by 70 to 90% when we work on construction projects in the midst of a pandemic. That acts as an independent link into my pandemic's argument, massively outweighing their entire case on magnitude because millions of people die if we have another COVID resurgence. Then, go on to their second link about jobs. Three responses on the link level. First of all, they're not actually going to create jobs. Their evidence just says that we centralize jobs into more specific positions in the manufacturing sector, meaning that we're just moving jobs around. We're not really creating new ones. Second of all, these jobs are all low income jobs because that's what manufacturing jobs tend to be, which means that these people that are in poverty right now or that are low income will continue to be low income. Nothing changes. They don't lift people out of poverty. Third of all, these jobs are high skill, meaning that low income workers generally can't afford education, so they won't even be able to get 
get these high skill jobs. High skill, low income jobs are not a good recipe for these low income people. But then, go on to the impact section where they talk about like these people going into poverty. First of all, you are one turn against this. When we increase debt spending rapidly, usually $3 trillion that we're going to have to sink into high speed rail, what actually happens is that we have to cut social spending as a result to fund this debt spending. That's really bad because when we don't have things like social spending, these people go into deeper poverty and even worse, they can't even afford food because they don't get the social spending from the government to do things like that. That's really bad. Then, go to the third link about climate change. There are two terms here. First of all, even though there's a 30% uh, forecasted decrease in passengers, this actually wouldn't happen because if the skies and the roads get less congested, more people would just want to use them because it's A, less expensive in speed, a lot more accessible and like easy to like drive on the roads, which means that we're just going to end up increasing CO2. It's going to cancel out in the long term. But then the second turn is from the Cision, or is from Cision in 2020 who writes that in order to stay green, high-speed rail has to use lithium batteries. But the mining process for this is absolutely terrible. As the OK Institute in 2011 writes that A, this mining causes enormous waste, emissions, and contamination that leads to even more CO2 in the air. But B, and more importantly, Amnesty in 2021 writes that the Democratic Republic of the Congo is the home of this lithium mining, and in order to do it, they exploit child laborers in order to get these lithium batteries in the first place. This outweighs their case on severity because these people are pushed into perpetual cycles of abuse because of this child labor, and that's way worse than any like the, like the couple of people in poverty that they talk about. That's everything on my flow. I guess I'll get, I can do some weighing. First of all, pandemics link into their argument about people being uh, disproportionately affected. For example, during the COVID pandemic, people that were low income weren't even able to go outside of their house and get a job in the first, uh, first place. Second of all, COVID actually caused more people to go into poverty because a lot of people lost their jobs, so they weren't even able they weren't, yeah, so a lot of people lost their jobs, meaning that we affect uh, poverty on a larger scale. And third of all, the argument outweighs massively on magnitude because if we win our extinction scenario and everybody dies, those low-income communities are also affected by that. So that would also be a pretty good weighing mechanism to go for. Uh, yeah. So vote for the uh, next. Yeah, and the only way to do that is with HSR. My opponent reads this overview about how ridership's gonna be low because tickets will be too expensive. However, one, this is not true. In France, tickets cost like nine euros per ticket, so it's not gonna be excessive. And then secondly, 
um, we tell you specifically with our GAL 20 evidence that HSR connects impoverished areas to cities, and we can see that with Schneider 18, that actually this decrease in commute time is gonna lead to an increase in ridership. But next onto the turn, um, you can cross apply our WEG 22 card, which tells you that with high-speed rail, we're going to be increasing this flow of ideas, so this is actually going to solve for the pandemic because it's gonna lead to more developments on vaccines than we're seeing in the status quo. But next, onto job creation. He says it doesn't create no jobs, but you can see through our HSRA evidence that tells you it creates 1.16 jobs annually just from construction, not to mention all the jobs that come from worker accessibility. And secondly, you can group the next two responses here and extend our Sherman 09 evidence, where we tell you that what we saw in the 08 recession was that we increased spending on infrastructure and this actually lifted six million people out of poverty. He then said this is going to lead to a trade-off in welfare, but he has no evidence of this. So again, you can just extend their Sherman on that evidence here. But finally, on to air pollution. Um, first, on the turn about um, less congestion causing this to an increase in cars and stuff, it's really like you can just cross apply our whole high evidence here, which is crucial because it tells you that by building HSR, we're going to, in each area, that saves 50,000 lives from air pollution, so they're currently killing new people in the status quo. But next on the second turn, I have two responses. One is not unique, there's lithium everywhere. You have lithium batteries in your phone, it doesn't solve. And secondly, HSR will be more efficient than people buying electric cars because now we can transport more people with less batteries. But now on Wayne, you have to be prioritizing these people in poverty over these existential threats that my opponent tells you about because we've been ignoring them for years. We keep making excuses for things like the pandemics and we'll keep making excuses until we actually do something about it. So let's fix it and build high-speed rail. But now onto Kate, onto his next case, starting off with the politics. He talks about moderates here, but there's more pressure and more pressure pressing issues for switching parties for moderates, such as Roe v. Wade and LGBT rights. It's really not, not even outweighs HSR. But secondly, onto gridlock, we actually don't see any backlash here. As the US High Speed Rail Coalition 22 tells you, more than 70% of Democrats still support, and 56% of registered voters support the state continuing to build the high speed rail project. But onto his point about Manson, He's not gonna be in office forever, and there's no evidence of him explicitly saying that he opposes HSR. And secondly, for his impact on climate change, you can just cross apply our third point about air pollution, which proves we solve better. And um, moving out to pandemics now, so I have a couple of responses. One, right, if we're on the brink of ending COVID, right now is the perfect time to be building this. Because if investment in the high speed rail happens now, when COVID's over, people can finally start using this transit once it's built. But secondly, I have a few turns. Um, one, you can turn it because as Hong Wu 22 tells you, in a study of 280 cities in China from 2008 and 2018, HSR significantly improved medical treatments as it centralized doctors to the biggest cities where they were needed most. And secondly, you can turn it again because as O'Sullivan 20 will tell you, HSR in France served as a more effective ambulance in the COVID pandemic as it can transport many more patients than helicopters over long distances. And this is crucially important because we can see that already so many people have died because they couldn't get to hospital hospitals in time. But secondly, he talks specifically about COVID in China. However, you can't look at China because they don't use the same vaccines like Moderna and Pfizer. So you can't correlate their effectiveness. And you can also not use, um, because we already see mutations in the status quo. So let's look at the long-term benefits that'll come from helping these people in poverty. So please affirm. China's COVID spread was like almost ground to a halt and they have an 89% vaccination yeah, rate. Yeah, but so China you say hasn't like been- pretty high? No, well, but China hasn't been releasing their studies, so we actually can't really get an accurate picture of what COVID looks like in that country. Right. Can I have a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so basically, 
again, like, I just don't see what the point here is with your point about lithium batteries. Like, if we already have lithium batteries in our phones so and computers. The, if the, impact, the impact is more of like a morality and severity impact, mm -hmm. right? So the more that we purchase these lithium batteries, the more we're perpetuating this child labor and the more we're condoning it, we should try and switch away from those types of like labor models. Like I shouldn't even have a phone right now and like I feel bad that I'm using a phone that has a lithium battery in it. But I don't think it would be a good idea to like have a three trillion dollar investment that causes these people to like have to, forces like these children to like mine for lithium batteries in horrible labor conditions. Wait, could I have a question? Yeah. Okay. So you just say like ambulances solve. Why are people going into these ambulances in the first place? Well, probably because they have COVID, right? Sorry, I probably should have explained it better, but what we're saying is that France actually converted like their trains, their high-speed rail trains, into like this mobile ambulance. Right. And because of that, they were able to like move these like infected people more safe than they would be able to in like a helicopter to get treatment. Yeah, but how did they get infected in the first place? Well, I mean, I can't answer that. Like we, like we saw at camps like, like this if, week that you know, so many yeah. people got COVID already. I mean, we could be getting COVID right now. We're in a close no. quarter area. Like, uh, what are we gonna hey. do? Okay, uh, is that my question? Okay, you can have a question. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, can you just like explain to me here, like how, like, how are you solving climate change here? Like, oh, through the Build Back Better? Yeah. Okay, so basically the Build Back Better has a bunch of climate provisions for things. Uh, it has like a bunch of climate provisions to like reduce our usage of like carbon emissions and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So like, I guess we can talk about your case. Yeah. You say that like people are going to be like being like be able to move to their jobs easier. Once again, like are those low income communities or is it just like everybody can move to their jobs? Or our gal funny card tells you that it specifically connects impoverished areas to cities, but like even if it is like only big city to big city, what we're telling you here is that if we even help like one person in poverty like get access to a job with high speed rail in one city, okay. then that's significantly better than the night world. Alright, got you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How much prep do I have? Four minutes. Like, so you have four minutes. Like, one forty. One forty. Got it. Thank you. I'll start running that now. That was 114 years. Is everybody ready? Where are you starting? Uh, I'm gonna start on my case. Or uh, actually, start on the win.
She said that we should prefer marginalized communities, but she can see the only prerequisite analysis that says that we impact those marginalized communities as well. Specifically, the prerequisite analysis is that when we're in times of COVID, we can't even get these people out of poverty because they're locked up in their homes. They can't even go outside and get a job. The second piece of prerequisite analysis that she can see is that people are going to go deeper into poverty because people that already had a job would lose their job during COVID. They get laid off, which pushes them deeper into poverty. This means that COVID is actually the best link into marginalized communities, specifically because you can see the scope analysis that from the Baryon evidence that says it spreads internationally rather than just in the, uh, the US because people can like move on airplanes to other countries. But how do we get to this win? It's pretty simple. Our argument about pandemics is clean. Remember that right now, yeah, remember that right now we're on the brink of reaching endemic stability, which is super crucial because it will make COVID just as like just as like harmless as a common cold. But if we were to implement high-speed rail, it would cause a rapid increase in resurgence. Specifically, our want evidence finds it would cause a 45% uh, cases of resurgence due to like close proximity within trains. The only thing that she says is that like. China isn't a good example of this because that's where our study is conducted. First of all, China has the highest vaccination rate, so it's probably an even better example than anywhere else in the world. And second of all, they say like China's vaccine is like ineffective, but they never read any sort of evidence saying that you can, they can't prove that. And so far as like they have the highest vaccination rate, I would say that you should prefer that over anything that they say. Then let's go to their terms. They say that like high-speed rail is going to be able to solve back for all of this, but through like things like ambulance transport and whatnot. But first of all, COVID is the root cause of this problem. People are going into these ambulances in the first place because the infection rate is increasing so much, which is really bad. And then, and then the second thing that they read is that like it's just gonna increase the amount of vaccination uh, because like you can increase the supply chain. COVID also is the root cause for why people have to get these vaccines in the first place. That makes the rest of the argument super clean. Remember, these, the Zhang evidence finds that another resurgence would happen if we had a 40, 45% increase in infections, and the King evidence finds that this is rapidly muted to the point where the virus would be unstoppable, which is why the Lingini evidence finds that it would cause another 10 years worth of COVID. That's really bad because the Barnum evidence finds that super spreader events would happen because we would move to other countries and we would spread the pandemic there. That's crucial because the Roberts evidence includes that 14 million people would die as a result of this rapid spread. You know, so yeah, we're winning our case, we're winning the Wang, we're basically winning the round. I guess I'll go into their case anyways. Um, even if you don't want to buy my links in the pandemics, you can just extend the worker turn that says that it would cause a 70 to 90% increase in the spread of COVID while we're working on infrastructure. This solves back for any of the things that they talk about with infrastructure spending su being super good because they also could see the weighing on this turn that it vastly outweighs their case because millions of people would die with this massive COVID spread. The one thing that they say is that the flow of ideas would increase the vaccination rate. Remember that COVID is the root cause of why we need these vaccines in the first place. We're winning the round of all metrics. Vote for the next.
To bridge the gap, we must create high-speed rails. Um, our worker mobility argument tells you that right now, people in poverty and uh, POC communities can't access jobs, as our TOMA 15 evidence tells you. Fortunately, our Schmeider 18 evidence tells you that, such as we saw in Germany, um, worker mobility increases when you build high-speed rails with 840,000 people um, using high-speed rails because of a 10% decrease in commute time, which our Beauchard 15 evidence tells you is the strongest factor to uh, escaping poverty. The only thing my opponents say on this is that they're uh, COVID prevents people from going to work, so that's a prerequisite, but we tell you that people are still working right now, like I still have to go to my job even if, um, if there's a pandemic right now, we still must solve for people in poverty, and in fact, um, the COVID pandemic makes it even more important that people have access to public transportation um, because it makes it harder for them to afford cars. But also, on air pollution, this goes conceded, so you can extend our HOHI evidence that tells you that we save 50,000 lives per city per year because we decrease um, air pollution in those cities, and a 3.5% decrease in air pollution saves that many lives. Imagine what we could do if we built a cross-country high-speed rail, um, and, but also now let's go on to their case. Um, they say that there's a prerequisite, but again, you can just we say that like people still need to work now, and their prerequisite relies on links that they um, that they drop like responses to. So, but I'll get to that later. You can extend our um, poverty first uh, wing because it's historically been put on the back burner in the face of existential impacts. It, do if it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if in 50 years climate change makes like um, less hospitable. If six million people are in poverty right now and can't put food on the table, and 50k people per city per year are dying from air pollution, um, but also. Um, there's always going to be existential impacts today. It's the pandemic tomorrow. It's going to be nuclear war and then it's going to be climate change Like there's never a, a time when there's no existential risk So you must prioritize poverty which we can solve directly through HSR because they could see that link But also let's go on to their um, uh, pandemic argument They uh, drop that we tell you that now is a really good time to build high-speed rail specifically because COVID is ending All of their arguments rest on ridership which transmits COVID But we tell you that because COVID takes a while to build anyways in a few years COVID will have died down like their own uniqueness concede so uniqueness overwhelms the link here and by the time um, people are actually riding the high-speed rails that it won't be able to transmit COVID but also they concede our Hongwu 22 efforts that tells you that medical development is better um, and uh, people have better access to health care which prevents pandemics in the first place this turns their entire argument and we access their impact of saving lives um, saving millions of lives uh, both in the US and overseas because we prevent um, pandemics better. This also links into our poverty impacts because um, people in poverty has have less access to um, services. Um, that's our Heller 21 and our Jenkins 20 evidence. So we actually solve for not only for healthcare in general, for everyone to access better healthcare, but also specifically people in poverty who right now don't have the same access as white communities, um, or POC and impoverished communities who ha don't have the same access as white and rich communities. I'll start the time for crossfire. No, so you extend these terms about how like people will be able to like, get healthcare because of ambulances. So isn't the COVID the root cause of why they have to go into these ambulances in the first place? So we're not actually going for that. We're going for the other the other term, which is saying that like by increasing access to healthcare, we actually can actually prevent pandemics from happening in the first place. Wait, because, how? Because by have well, okay, there's a few ways this happens, right? First of all, we tell you that like by increasing access to healthcare, people can see better doctors faster, and that like solves for like underlying yeah. conditions that make COVID more deadly. But they have to they have to get sick in the first place, right? So if we no, rapidly because, increase the transmission of COVID, that means that these like ambulances are going to be like more filled up with people with COVID. No, so, like, that, people that's with the root cause. Of underlying it. conditions and people with already bad health are the people who are dying from COVID, not completely healthy. People like you and I, who are right, like so most likely more resilient to COVID, the people who are most likely to die from COVID are one people in poverty who don't have access to healthcare, and people with right, underlying so conditions. By increasing so how many, access, so how many people would these ambulances solve for? Like we're this not COVID affects millions of people. You never gave any sort of impact terminalization on this term. You never told me how many people it affects. We're not saying that we're like that's not the argument we're going for anymore. We're not saying that like we're, we're using. HSR as an ambulance. We're saying that by riding HSR, people from poor communities with less access to medical resources can go to bigger cities with better medical resources. Yeah, but that's still like links into because like COVID would still even more without people, right? even if COVID wasn't happening right now, increased access to medical services is good. Okay, like, you're gonna have a question. Okay, um, on your sorry. <laughs> 
So on your pandemic argument, you say that like um, high speed, like COVID is dying down like right now. So like how long do we have to wait? Like if COVID, let's say it's like tomorrow, COVID gets a lot worse than it is right now, right? right. So do we have to wait for like the pandemic to completely be over I would say we, do we, would, we would wait for it to reach endemic stability so we don't call, risk another resurgence, which would like mitigate any of the benefits of having a high-speed rail in the first place. So do you think we should just never build a high-speed rail or that do you agree that high-speed rail right should now, eventually be built? I think right now is a terrible time to build it. And but right now is when you're proposing to affirm the resolution. I don't think we should do that because it would cause massive spreads of COVID, which would But do you agree energy. that high-speed rail eventually should be built? I mean, no. I mean, okay. So, like, you're so proposing, you're you're proposing that we affirm the resolution. You're, you're proposing that we affirm the resolution today, though. And in the status quo, it's not a good condition to be built. I can't really That's speak not on my whether. Question, though. My question I can't really is... speak on the fact, like, if it's like going to be good in the future, right? Like, I don't, I don't know about that because that's what, not what your case was about. But. All right. Oh yeah, it's like 10 seconds left. Uh, I think I have like, Chris, do I have like 30 seconds left? Um, 36 seconds. 36 seconds, okay, I'll start that 26. now. 26. my time now she always talks about how people in poverty are being put on the back burner right now but she still fails to respond to the pre election analysis that people on the back burner are being further affected by covid because a they can't even get a job in the first place because they can't go outside because of like the rapid spread of the pandemic and b people are getting like laid off from their jobs due to covid which causes them to go into deeper even deeper into poverty that means that people on the back burner are being affected by COVID. We control the link to this argument on a wider scope because of the conceded Baryam analysis. This says that COVID spreads internationally, which means it's not just in the U.S. It's in countries where people don't have as much social spending, etc. So how do we get here? It's pretty simple. The argument is basically conceded. Remember at the top, or remember that right now we're on the brink of endemic stability because of like new vaccines rolling out. But if we were to implement HSR, we'd increase the infection rate by 45%. The only thing that they say are these turns about like how we can use ambulances to solve and how we can like move people to cities to get better access to healthcare. First of all, I'm pretty sure that's not what the initial turn was. And second of all, this has no impact, so we would still outweigh, it doesn't matter. Then extend the fact that as this virus gets worse, it starts to mutate rapidly, which is really bad because when it mutates rapidly, it gets to an unstoppable point, which is why the Lungini evidence finds that it would another 10 years worth of COVID. This is really bad because the far enough evidence finds that it would spread internationally and the, uh, because like people can go to other countries through planes and stuff and spread it there. That's really crucial because 14 million people would die per the World Health Organization evidence. We're winning their case, we're winning the wing, we're winning the round. But one more thing on their case, they entirely concede the fact that worker mobility is actually a really bad thing because it spreads COVID even more. The only thing that they say is this, they read this new response that people still get go to work during COVID. No, they don't. Millions of people were kicked out of their jobs during COVID and millions of people, millions of more people couldn't even get jobs in the first place. This is also a new response, so you shouldn't evaluate it. That means that they increase, that like, Construction on this project increases the spread of COVID 70 to 90%, once again, outweighing their impact on magnitude and the prerequisite that I said earlier. It's super clean for the, uh, for the negative. Oh, okay.
just, you know what, I'll just sign post as I go. We're gonna figure it out. Anyone not ready? All right. <laughs> Starting the time now. We need to bridge the gap. And again, the only way to get millions of people out of poverty is through HSR. And that's the main issue in today's debate. This prerequisite argument doesn't matter because there's always going to be some other existential threat, whether it's climate change, whether it's nuclear war. What we need to stop doing is making excuses of why we can't get people out of poverty when it's simple. It's The answer is high-speed rail. So you're going to be voting on it for us for our point about worker flexibility. Because the only thing my opponent says in response to this is an argument about pandemic, but you can again extend our turn here where we tell you that HSR is actually solving better for this. And secondly, even if you don't buy our argument on that, high-speed rail isn't just gonna exist tomorrow. Our con construction time solves for all of these impasses because construction is gonna take time, COVID's going to end, and then once these rails are built and COVID is over, these people can finally access these jobs. Because this is crucial, because as Bouchard 15 tells you, the root cause of poverty in America, it isn't COVID, it isn't crime, it's commute times. And the only way we can reduce that is with high-speed rail. So even as long as you believe that high-speed rail should be built at some point in the future because of because of worker flexibility, because of job creation, because of solving for air pollution, you're going to be voting for the app because we're we're the only side here that is care, that cares about these people that are suffering in poverty because they lack access to these jobs. So you need to weigh poverty over any of these other impacts because it's it's crucial because high speed rail can solve. We can give these people access to jobs. We can give these people access to the economy. We can't just stop all that because of COVID. People still go to work because of COVID. So, and if anything, we're just going to improve the medicine here. So to solve the root cause of poverty, I please affirm. Salt. You got to do it all individually. Done filling out your ballot, just hand it to me.
most likely to go over time. <laughs> Colin. Colin. Most likely to open an umbrella in McGuffey Hall and scream frog. <laughs> also, most likely to do an analytical rebuttal with 15 turns. Aiden. Most likely to do 5,000 pen tricks in a round. <laughs> Eric. Most likely to ask, how is your day going in cross? <laughs> Bohan. Most likely to take prep and final focus to eat food. <laughs> oh, I'm eating right now. <laughs> also, also, most likely to, to spend final focus talking about frogs. Uh, Nicholas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where's Nicholas? I didn't bolt his name. Oh, yes, I did. Most likely to go to a tournament with Drip. And <laughs> Most likely to run a critique successfully. <laughs> Ramsey. Most likely to run an impact turn that human death is good. <laughs> Most likely to drop their computer. <laughs> Gabe. Yes. Gabe, Gabe, Gabe. Gabe, where is Gabe? Oh, there, this one's good. <laughs> Most likely to be the next Mr. Paik. Yeah. <laughs> and Henry. Most likely to flow with a horizontal paper. <laughs> <laughs> actually represent the pillars of CDC, in fact. We got you 80 envelopes. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's for Dylan. Dylan, we got you napkins. <laughs> oh, the scrunchie. That's Eric. Eric, you got the scrunchie. Is, I think this is 
Sean gets the snowman. Well, we have the cards, right? Oh, right. Yeah. Hmm? Happy Mother's Day card. Let's go!